Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome once again to a great event here at the Muscarelli Museum. Thrilled to have such a great crowd tonight. Um, as you know, we're working through this fall a sequence on the history of the Muscarelli, touching base on our collection and talking about the arc of collecting over 40 years and even long in front of that period of time. Okay, that wasn't the right button. I don't know if you've all had a chance to visit, but I hope you will. We have an exhibition at the Stryker Center here in Central Williamsburg, charting our 40 year history and talking about a lot of the twists and turns in our history. And I hope you get, out, get a chance to get out and see it on view through November 3rd. After tonight, we have a couple more sessions in our sequence this fall. I'll be talking on October 10th about new directions in our collection and some of the areas we've been trying to fill over the course of the past five years. And then we'll have Barbara Bueller Lines coming in uh, on October 17th to talk about one of our favorites, our favorite artists at the Muscarelli, Georgia O'Keeffe. Of course, we all know the great story about White Flower. She is an art historian and founding curator of the Georgia O'Keeffe Museum. We have the gallery players presenting Mussorgsky's uh, pictures at an exhibition on November 29th at 7 p.m. And where is that, Julie? The New Music Building. The New Music Building, I think, venue to be finalized in the coming uh, weeks. And then on December 5th, we have the amazing artist and poet Nell Painter coming to be our voice of the artist for this fall semester. So I hope you'll be able to join us for that. That is here, right, Julie? Uh, no, Commonwealth. Commonwealth Auditorium in Sadler Center. Next up after tonight, though, is Saturday, September 30th, this Saturday, Community Art Day at the Williamsburg Community Center. We have a lot going on. It's a fun-filled day, a lot of art making, art exploration, and also music. So I hope you'll be able to come out and join us from 1 to 7 p.m. on Saturday. We have a lot of fall workshops, a number of them still left. Relief wood sculpture with Donald Wilson, who is amazing, on October 16th. We have Art of the Book, November 9th and 10th. And then for teens, we have a screen printing workshop on November 6th. Our docents are doing a great sequence beginning next Wednesday at the Williamsburg Public Library called Art in the Afternoon. That'll be every Wednesday at 2 p.m. through the month of October. So if you're free, I hope you can join, join us for those events. And then maybe one of the biggest events for the entire fall is our grand dinner celebration celebrating 40 years of the Muscarelli on November 17th. Tickets are on sale now. Um, there are members tickets, there are non-members tickets, a little bit higher priced, and then we have special prices for faculty and students for those, uh, and staff as well, for, for that dinner. And so we hope to see you that night. I urge you to buy tickets early. I think we're capped at 250 people, and we're fearful that there's going to be a lot more demand than for 250 seats. Well, tonight we have a really distinguished guest joining us, Jack Rasmussen. He is the director and curator of the American University Museum at the Katzen Arts Center. And my predecessor and I spent time, I think a little bit more than a decade ago, visiting Jack in his museum. It's a beautiful building that sits on the circle right by American University's campus in Northwest DC. Dr. Rasmussen earned his bachelor's degree in art from Whitman College before launching a very long association with American University and a notable arts career in the DC region. He holds several degrees from American University, including, and I think this is really great, master's degrees in painting, arts management and anthropology, and then a PhD in anthropological linguistics. He began his career in 1975 as assistant director of the Washington Project for the Arts. He then owned and operated the Jack Rasmussen Gallery, a vital part of DC's art scene until he closed it in 1983. From 1989 to 1992, he helped conceive, launch, and operate the Rockville Arts Place in suburban Maryland. And he then became executive director of Maryland Art Place, MAP, in Baltimore 
a nonprofit contemporary art center serving the Mid-Atlantic in a post that he held for 10 years. After MAP, Jack was named executive director of the DeRosa Preserve Art and Nature, a great contemporary art museum and natural habitat in Napa, California. Dr. Rasmussen is president of the Mid-Atlantic Association of Museums, member of the board of directors of the Amalfi Coast Muse Music and Arts Festival. I really thank Jack for being here tonight and want to give him a warm welcome to William and Mary and the Muscarelli Museum. Thank you for the introduction and uh, the invitation to come and talk to you today. And thank you for your support of the Muscarelli. The formative time for baby boomers like me uh, was called the long 60s by uh, anti-war and civil rights activist Tom Hayden, uh, who <clears throat> you'll remember was the husband of Jane Fonda, uh, roughly the years 1957 to 1982. So I'm going to talk about what I think about the art of Gene Davis in the context of our regional and uh, national cultures that produced the long 60s. Uh, most of the work I discuss comes from the American University Museum's collection and is by artists of the Mid-Atlantic region, which includes you. One of the defining characteristics of Washington art made during the long 60s was its adherence to aesthetic and commercial constraints that encouraged artists to remain silent in the face of bias, violence, and war. In other words, Gene Davis and the Washington Color School took pains to avoid social and political content. Whether for aesthetic or commercial concerns, you be the judge. It's the curator's job to deliver an aesthetic, emotional, and meaningful experience, one that illuminates for engaged viewers their own lives and times, how your lives are intertwined with and shaped by your experience of the past and your perception of the present. Every exhibition is an opportunity to address what we can see of the past from our contemporary perspective and what we can see of ourselves. So think of this PowerPoint as really an exhibition without walls. From my perspective in 2023 America, I can see the persistent systemic gender and racial injustice and bias and violence that was present here in the 50s, exposed in the 60s, and continues to the present day. The long 60s for me began in Appleton, Wisconsin in 1957. I was in the third grade watching the funeral of Wisconsin Senator Joseph McCarthy uh, McCarthy is seen here with his chief counsel and fixer, Roy Cohn. I've heard the term McCarthyism repeated by my parents many times, mostly in anger. They were talking about the Red Scare, McCarthy's practice of making unfounded accusations against federal employees, artists, and others they suspected of being communist sympathizers, or worse, gay. He further fanned our fears of nuclear war. I remember the duck and cover drills every morning at my elementary school right after the Pledge of Allegiance. I know this might seem like ancient history to many of you, but looking out there, I think maybe some of you remember. Uh, this is not so far from today, uh, something like see something, say something. Let's take a look at art being produced in the Washington region at the time. This is Lavender Blue, an early painting by Washington Color School artist Kenneth Noland. In 1957, abstract expressionism was the dominant art movement in the US. Huge canvases, strong gestures, and emotional content. We can see all these elements at play in this painting. We now know abstract expressionism, as well as uh, jazz, was employed by, as a Cold War weapon by the CAA in its fight against communism. Our government used our music and art to demonstrate to the world how free we were, how open we were to self-expression. Never mind that abstract expressionists were mostly leftists then being hounded by McCarthy, Richard Nixon, and the House Un-American Activities Committee, or that our black jazz musicians remained second-class citizens when they returned home in 
uh, from, from being our ambassadors. Many of you probably heard about the artist Helen Frankenthaler's experiments in her studio and her discovery that thinned oil paint would soak into and stain unprimed canvas. There was no need anymore for paintings to be made with the brush manipulated by the artist's hand. Thinned paint flowed where directed by gravity. So Noland visited Frankenthaler's studio, saw her painting Mountains and Sea, and Washington painting was never the same. Advanced painting became stained painting, making possible color field painting and the rise of the Washington Color School. Acclaimed by some as the climax of modernism in the first half of the 20th century, others saw it as modernism's dead end, disconnected as it was from the socio-political disorder of the times. The formalism of critic Clement Greenberg, illustrated most perfectly by the Washington Color School, imposed very strict limitations on artists. Only art's purely visible aspects were important. Intentions had no place, nor did gestures of the artist's hand, drawing, subject matter, pictorial illusion, or narrative content of any kind. Any relationship at all to the visible world, let alone its social and political, political context, was discouraged. Howard Maring was a student of Nolan's at Catholic University. He too made a pilgrimage to meet Frankenthaler with fellow student Tom Downing. The size and overall composition of Maring's playground shows its debt to abstract expressionism, but the relatively measured coolness of his application showed he was moving towards what would become the Washington Color School. At the same time, Nolan and Maring were abandoning personal gestural expression for cooler, more remote abstractions. Robert Franklin Gates and other regional artists were moving in the opposite direction, turning back towards figuration but keeping its vigorous expressionist brushwork. They were part of a larger resistance which included artists like Richard Diebenkorn associated with the San Francisco Bay Area Figurative School. Both Gates and Diebenkorn were greatly influenced by the Phillips Collection, our first museum for modern art. Gates was a student and then teacher at the Phillips uh, Gallery Art School until the US entered World War II and Diebenkorn was a Marine stationed, uh, stationed here and uh, taken advantage of the Phillips Collection and, and knew Gates at the time. Gene <clears throat> uh, Davis, uh, there's a picture in Gene Davis, 1959. He's still a, a, an, a, an abstract expressionist. Gates and American University were largely responsible for the continued relevance of figurative and expressionist painting in Washington for the next 30 years. They kept it alive, though it is clear that figurative and expressionist painting was not what mainstream white male artists were doing in the 60s and into the 70s. This is Gene Davis uh, with an abstract expressionist painting of 1959. He very soon abandoned abstract expressionism for the color school and his trademark stripes as we entered the 1960s. The actual 1960s started for me with John F. Kennedy's presidential campaign and election. Assassinations and war would soon radically change the course of the decade from optimism to despair. The Civil Rights Movement finally reached national consciousness with the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, but within months of becoming law, the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution committed the United States to full-scale war in Vietnam. Despite the passage of major civil rights legislation, systemic racism combined with the Vietnam War, the draft, and the unsustainable living conditions of the poor in our cities exposed our country's mistake and even tragic priorities fighting overseas while our neighborhoods were on fire, uh, literally. In 1968 is the pivotal year in the long 60s. Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated on April 4th, the day after violence erupted in downtown Washington, for example, leaving hundreds of burnt out buildings in commercial districts and residential areas that are still being rebuilt today. Shortly after the assassination of Robert Kennedy and the cataclysmic 1968 Democratic Convention, where demonstrators were assaulted by police officers on live television, Richard Nixon and Spiro Agnew were elected on their law and order platform. Campus disturbances spread to every major school. Hundreds of thousands 
gathered to demonstrate against the war and university policies allowing military recruiters on campus. Soon after the 1968 presidential election, the peace movement began to turn violent out of a deep frustration over its inability to effect change. The violence came to a head in 1970 with the killing of students at Kent State by National Guard troops. It became clear in the 60s, in the late 60s, that attempts to bring peaceful change would fail. Many in my generation dropped out rather than take their politics to its logical conclusion, the streets. The counterculture arrived with free love, self-prescribed medications, and great music. Our cultural revolution had uh, very mixed results. We now know, for example, that LSD was developed by the CIA and used in mind control experiments between 1953 and 1964. In fact, peace activist Tom Hayden argued that the drug-fueled counterculture, and I quote, overtook, competed with, and weakened the idea of radical political reform. Interesting. He's, his argument explains why there was so little socially or politically engaged painting by white male artists in the 60s and early 70s, and why the counterculture would produce so little, little lasting political reform. Gene Davis. White male artists remained disconnected from what was happening around them. Uh, Davis made this painting in 1966. It's the perfect expression of Washington color school painting. I'll tell a story on myself. In 1968, as an undergraduate painting student at Whitman College, I decided to paint my own Gene Davis stripe painting because I wanted to solve a mystery. What was Gene Davis really doing with those stripes? They couldn't just be stripes. I thought perhaps the first letter of each color could be spelling out a message, for example. <laughs> Well, it turns out the stripes are just stripes. But uh, <laughs> I believe the commercial and critical success of the color school has more to do with its separation from politics than its strictly decorative qualities. Here we have the perfect corporate art, born of an art movement whose content did not have to be explained because it had none. It avoided controversy by being only about itself and can be shown without risk of embarrassment, or more importantly, risk of defunding the venue that gave it space. To really understand the great divide that existed in the 60s Washington art between the white male mainstream and women and artists of color, one need only compare two paintings made in 1969, consider grid number six by Tom Downing, shown here. So I mean, what started as a liberating moment for artists under the sway of the Washington Color School ended in an aesthetic lockdown exemplified by this work by Downing. In contrast to Downing's work, this painting by Joe Shannon explodes out of the times in which it was made. He was born in Puerto Rico. Uh, Shannon's work had no hesitation about challenging Washington's dominant sensibilities. It addressed social, political, and professional ills in a city so dedicated to the buttoned up and uncontroversial, it's not surprising that Shannon's paintings achieved uh, critical but little financial success. They were not a big influence on most Washington painters. What little figurative art that was still being made was becoming sanitized and toned down in the hands of white mainstream artists. Uh-oh. What have I done? Oh, <clears throat> In the 70s, the more critically and financial, su financially successful, predominantly white mainstream artists continued to adhere to color school rules and ignore current events. But a few, notably women and artists of color, were beginning to work outside the system in unorthodox, non-traditional, or collaborative art forms to pursue social political engagement. Two African American artists, uh, Alma Thomas and Kenneth Victor Young borrowed from the color school. Pretty clearly, you know, her big influence was Jean Davis. Uh, borrowed from the color school and then innovated. Both carefully addre avoided addressing race, gender, and politics in their art. Thomas was the first graduate of Howard University's fine arts program in 1924 
She taught in the DC public schools for 38 years while taking painting classes from Robert Gates and others <coughs> excuse me, at American University. In the 1960s, finally retired from teaching, she came under the influence of the Washington Color School, took classes at the Corcoran, hung out with Jean Davis, and uh, away we go. Thomas went on to achieve great critical success with her dynamic, rhythmic, geometric compositions of thickly applied strokes of color against white backgrounds. Her painting here appears to owe much to Jean Davis, but she clearly departed from the color school through her expressive gestural application of paint. That was no, no. Her title was references, also references a contemporary event, the moon landing, something Clement Greenberg would not have been very happy about. <laughs> Kenneth Victor Young, uh, like Thomas, uh, avoided mixing race and art, saying an artist is an artist and his color has nothing to do with it. I don't like labeling a man a black artist. And he argued, argued frequently with Jeff Donaldson, a pioneer of the black arts movement of the 60s and 70s and the chair of the Howard University Art Department, which was producing more socially and politically active artists than the other uh, regions, other educational institutions. It took courage, focus, self-awareness, and ambition to be a black artist making abstract paintings during the 60s and 70s. The black arts movement had a manifesto that expected artists to reflect the beauty of their community in no uncertain terms. Howard University's Jeff Donaldson founded a radical group called Afrocobra, the African Commune of Bad Relevant Artists, <laughs> that is still active today. Uh, but Kenneth Young wanted nothing to do with the group. It speaks volumes about the continued dominance of white mainstream white artists that no works by Donaldson or other Afrocobra artists made their way into American University's collection over the past 40 years. Uh, I had to borrow this work from a private collector in order to provide a more accurate, comprehensive vision of the DC art scene than a narrow focus on the Washington Color School and Museum Collections allows. So Donaldson introduced provocative ideas in his art and so wasn't being shown or collected by museums. Note the title, Majorities, for this uh, painted collage. It's actually on corrugated cardboard that's been peeled away in different places. It's really very beautiful. You can't really see it on a slide, but uh, amazing object. Um, and the indigenous, Ameri indigenous American motifs in this piece. Even Howard University's museum does not have a Jeff Donaldson in its collection, and neither were the works of less political African-American abstract artists like Young being collected at the time, with a few notable exceptions. This is Big Al Carter. Uh, two African-American artists whose work managed to be somewhat figurative, non-political, and find homes in museums were Alan Big Al Carter and Franklin White. I was a graduate teaching assistant at American University in 1975 when Big Al was a student there. That was an experience. Uh, he was big, you may have guessed, I don't know. But, and, and very um, uh, amazing personality. Carter's three-dimensional duck provides a taste of this irrepressible, barely controlled, cartoon-influenced artist, clearly challenging the American University figurative style. Carter taught for 30 years in alternative schools in Arlington County and set a powerful model for creativity in the community. And his work eventually made its way into several museum collections. Franklin White um, received his BFA and MFA from Howard University and taught at the Corcoran School of Art for 30 years alongside uh, Gene Davis. This seven foot by 14 foot oil still life is so large it had to be painted in the Corcoran's Hemicycle Gallery in advance of his one-person exhibition there in 1973. Then it did not leave storage for almost 50 years when we got it, when the Corcoran closed and we received 9,000 pieces from its collection. Uh, so imagine trying to digest that. Uh, White's paintings did not overtly engage in social or political commentary. Instead, he gave us this immense, bold, vibrant, beautiful still life, celebrating the domestic details of his life and what was 
they had a rather rough neighborhood on Swan Street Northwest in the early 70s in a most dramatic, transcendent, and ultimately political fashion. In the year 2000, he moved to Venezuela, where his art seemed to fuse music, food, and nature. There is a subversive quality in his joyous work that challenges expectations that perpetuate the status quo. And he has a show up right now of his uh, Venezuelan uh, works in our museum. So if you're in Washington, uh, come, come check it out. Two other figurative artists associated with the Corcoran acknowledged Corcoran's school influence, then went in the opposite direction, following their own surrealist muse. They formed the Washington Color Pencil School and exhibited together in 1973. The school consisted of William Newman, Lisa Montag Brotman, and others. It was a consciously rebellious act. Color painting was conceptually not enough for many artists. Their sense of escapism, fantasy, and social commentary were the result of an active engagement with the disturbing events of the 60s and 70s going on around them. Look carefully at Newman's painting. Uh, actually, I think the real title is Boiling in Mental Water, uh, not Bathing in Mental Water. Uh, you can just make out the legendary eccentric curator Walter Hopps in the window to the left. I don't know if you know who Walter Hopps is, but he's sort of like the quintessential erratic genius uh, uh, curator of, that went, went through Los Angeles and Washington and ended up starting the D Damon Neal collection and uh, an amazing career. Um, the painting is a testament to the omnipresence of Hopps's independent if erratic curatorial spirit, a counterweight favoring the extraordinary skill and provocative subject matter of Washington's ascendant figurative painters over the constrictions of the color school, which remember is going on right at the same time and getting all the critical and commercial attention. This is uh, Lisa Montag Brotman, uh, playing for keeps, was one of her series of female figures in surreal settings. Here, Brotman appropriated the figure of a masked prostitute in a brothel from a vintage black and white photograph and transplanted her to a fantasy setting at once both splendid and threatening. Masked, she confronts the viewer directly with strength and vulnerability, knowledge, and innocence. So one definition of feminist art calls for images explicitly directed towards achieving female liberation and empowerment. Following this de definition, I found very few feminist painters in our collections. Of course, many feminist artists turned away from painting at the time, preferring the newer than unorthodox methods of performance art, conceptual art, body art, film, photography, and crafts. Uh, the absence of paintings by feminist artists from our collection is also a function of what was being shown in commercial galleries and purchased by collectors at the time and what would eventually be accessioned by museums from those private collections. So what I'm describing for you is, is why you can't just go into a collection and think you're getting the picture of what, was, what happened, because the only people in there are artists who were purchased, probably from a commercial gallery, with the resources to then donate it to a museum later on. So you're getting a very small small slice. And so how do you, how do you redress that? That's sort of the, the theme for a lot of museums around the country, trying to figure out how to do that. <clears throat> there was certainly demonstrable sexism during the long 60s in the marketplace and in our institutions, and of course it continues today. Even if most women painters in Washington did not self-identify as feminist artists, they were clearly influenced by the movement. The women I'm showing here present strong confrontational subject matter. As Brotman describes her relationship to feminist art, and I quote, my women paintings of the 80s were definitely a reaction to the women's movement, as well as my personal feelings about the inherently conflicting messages coming from our culture 
for a young artist mother with small children. This is painted by William, Willem de Looper, a student of Gates at American University and then found early success uh, with his atmospheric paintings in line with color school orthodoxy uh, and the likes of uh, Morris Lewis. His work did depart from the color school because he still employed brushes and canvases primed with gesso rather than leaving them raw and more absorbent for staining and more susceptible to conservation problems later on. Beginning in 1972, De Looper experimented with different paint applications and materials and discovered rollers used by commercial house painters. De Looper's use of rollers allowed the application of paint and the construction of composition to be one action or gesture. In so doing, he found the perfect balance between accident and intent, building up layers as he rolled paint horizontally across the canvas, revealing shimmering patterns left visible from previous passes. Now, while female artists were relatively hard to find in our collections, there was an abundant supply of paintings of women by men and the women were quite often portrayed without clothing. William Woodward, like uh, De Looper, studied under Gates and at American University and retained their painterly touch while producing sensual realist works like Kimono. Uh, this is Alan Feltis, also taught at American University, who's a, uh, these are gorgeously painted, often unclothed nudes, with their flawless services and brooding androgyny. Uh, are now exhibited internationally. By the mid-1970s, figurative art was on the ascendancy in Washington. Paul Richard, uh, the Washington Post critic, uh, wrote a 1997 article in the Post called The Museum is Their Muse, explaining why he thought there were so many superb realist figurative painters in Washington. He called them National Gallery School painters. Three of the best are women, uh, Rebecca Davenport, Manon Cleary, and Michael Hunter. Rebecca Davenport's portrait of Rebecca Cooper was spot on in portraying her Peace Street art dealer's well-known eccentricities, topping off her portrait with Cooper's famously spacey countenance, decolletage, and very 70s bell bottoms. Um, she was a piece of work. Uh, Manon Cleary's portrait of her art dealer, Ramon Asuna, titled Ramon After Lunch, shows him napping on the ground after lunch wrapped in an art moving blanket. One of Cleary's trademark giant white rats strolls by beyond his dreaming head, perhaps a nod to Washington's somewhat concealed surrealist streak we've been noticing as we go along here, that the sort of the other side of the Washington Color School is something very different. Um, Michael Hunter, this is a portrait of Walter Hopps at the Ambassador Grill, 3.31 a.m. Um, Michael's portrait of legendary night owl curator Walter Hopps, repainted in 2018, was originally painted in 1978. The artist was fresh out of graduate school and new to Washington. Hopps saw Hunter's work and sought her out for a portrait choosing how, how he wanted to be portrayed in front of a neon sign in an all-night diner. The original portrait was purchased, but then disappeared when the collector, an associate of Spiro Agnew's, went to prison. <laughs> the idealism of the 60s gradually wore away during the 70s when the war and subsequent draft, political scandals, addiction, inflation, rising poverty, and malaise, to quote a phrase, Reagan's inaugural ball in, 19, in January 1981 featured Donnie and Marie Osmond as the entertainment, which was fairly emblematic of the Reagan era's disconnect from the counterculture. Tom Green began as an abstract artist coming out of the University of Maryland in the 60s, heavily influenced by the color school, and he taught with Gene Davis at the Corcoran for many years. Uh, he never became a figurative artist, but he did develop his own iconography, uh, pulling away from that color school, and frequently addressed overtly political and social conditions in his hybrid abstractions. Beirut, it's called Beirut, brings the geographically remote human tragedy, the siege of 
Beirut, then reported nightly on our television screens into our consciousness today, not unlike the siege of Kiev, it asks us to consider our culpability in this and future tragedies and to bear witness. Sam Gilliam, born in Tupelo, Mississippi in 1933, he moved to Washington after the Army in 1962, where he flirted, flirted with the Washington Color School and then broke all the Washington Color School rules by innovating, experimenting, looking forward. He took the Color School as his jumping off point and kept pushing and expanding the medium. Muse 3 is one of four painting series, a four painting series completed in 1982. Gillian describes the series as like a musical composition played multiple times by a musician, repeated but nuanced and never exactly the same. So Muse 3 displays his experimental collaging of thick layers of color saturated, saturated acrylic polymer on a shaped canvas, recalling the color patterns and shapes of African American quilt making traditions from slavery through the present time. He broke out of the rectangle by attaching, you know, he famously took his paintings off the stretchers and, and draped them in, in, uh, in museums. Um, he broke out of the rectangle by attaching a D-shaped enameled aluminum object to the lower right-hand corner here. Uh, Gilliam made his own rules. He disrupted the cool of the color school. Here, his painting tools were literally the rake and the knife. So he worked on the floor, and these are about almost an inch thick. It was hard to, and then he, then he would cut them into this collage-like form around the shaped canvas. They're really beautiful objects. <clears throat> Beginning in 1957, we saw the white mainstream's evolution towards flat decorative abstraction in Washington. Observe the painterly and expressive pushback through the 70s and into the 80s, led by a growing recognition of the centrality of women and African American artists to the Washington art world. I came of age in a turbulent time, as turbulent as now. We began with an image of Senator McCarthy with his fixer, Roy Cohn. I'm gonna end the long 60s with another strikingly similar image of Roy Cohn, this time with Donald Trump. Before he died of AIDS, Cohn served as Donald Trump's fixer in the early 80s, defending Trump's real estate company against charges it had systematically discriminated against black tenants. This photo, in retrospect, provides further proof that progress is just an illusion that battles can be won, as battles were won in the 60s, but the war is long. There is unrest again in the streets of Washington and across the country over the denial of civil rights and the persistence of racism and systemic social and economic inequality and injustice. The Black Lives Matter movement appears to be having a transformational impact on the way the US is confronting its past and present but it remains to see, be seen how long it will hold our attention. Even now, the public seems to be losing interest as it lost interest in voting rights and abortion rights after initial gains during the long 60s. Art history is replete with great artists fully engaged with their world. During the two world wars, there were movements like Dada, Surrealism, Expressionism, and great artists, Max Ernst, George Gross, Otto Dix, Pablo Picasso who spoke clearly, sometimes elegantly, sometimes brutally, about the times they were living through. Between the wars, social realism produced Ben Shahn, Jacob Lawrence, Romer Bearden, Raphael Sawyer, and many others protesting injustice and inequality. But we know, even today, artists are systematically excluded from galleries and museums, and thereby left out of the art historical canon and out of our collections, out of our view. Since World War II, there have been plenty more wars and more, much human suffering. Where were the artists who would stand up and make us confront uncomfortable, sometimes tragic truths about ourselves? Most art that was made during the long 60s did address civil rights, women's rights, LGBTQ rights, environmental degradation, and the waste of war, but it was excluded from commercial galleries and museum collections. This remains true today. Museum collections represent less of what artists were making as we lived through the long 60s and more about whose work was given wall space 
in commercial galleries who was buying art between 1957 and 1982 and what museums had been purchasing or accepting as gifts. After supplementing work from our collections uh, by borrowing and soliciting gifts, still only 25% of the artists represented, presented in this talk are women and 25% are people of color. As women and African Americans both make up about 50% of Washington's population, this talk falls far short of offering a balanced view of art made during the long 60s. I had to reach outside our collections to secure loans or gifts so this, this talk could begin to disrupt the received white art historical narrative. There's so much that still needs to be done. There have been occasions when white mainstream artists felt they had the freedom and support to make art that reflected their time. Women and black artists had neither the freedom nor the support, but they persevered and made great contributions. The Works Progress Administration, operating during the Depression between the World Wars, provided jobs for artists and enabled social realism to flourish. The opposite happened at the beginning of the long 60s. Artists of all media were subjected to accusations of subversion or treason and sometimes threatened with the loss of livelihoods if their subject matter was perceived to be the left of Senator McCarthy. This had a chilling effect on the social political engagement of mainstream white artists that extended well into the 70s and can still be felt today. The 60s were a very tumultuous time, but its social movements and struggles eventually allowed for some progress towards ending discrimination, securing rights, protecting the environment, and creating an awareness of the constant warfare we are engaged in around the world. No thanks to the color school. It took a generation to recover from the repressive climate of the 50s. Now we are again living in dangerous times. Federal funding for the arts is threatened whenever difficult or controversial subjects are addressed. The culture wars persist. We need our arts institutions, our curators, donors, directors, and boards to be transformed by new efforts to balance and share power in the art world. And now more than ever, we need artists free to engage with today's problems to reach an audience and to offer resolution and inspire us with hope. Thank you. Thank you.